Tonight, an inauguration like no other, Joe Biden sworn in as President of the United States, a nation divided. We must end this uncivil war that pits red against blue. Good evening, I'm Juanita Phillips. This is ABC News. Straight to work, the 46th president wastes no time dismantling his predecessor's legacy. Kamala Harris makes history as the first female, first black and first Asian American vice president. It is my honour to be here, to stand on the shoulders of those who came before. And Donald Trump takes one last flight on Air Force One, snubbing the inauguration. Goodbye. We love you. We will be back in some form. Joe Biden has vowed to restore the soul of America, promising to unwind Donald Trump's legacy and unify his fractured nation. In front of a masked crowd and more than 25,000 National Guard troops, Mr Biden was sworn in on the same steps that were besieged by a violent mob just two weeks ago. With the threat of violence and the virus still raging, the National Mall was eerily empty. Crowds were replaced with flags, representing the 400,000 lives lost to the pandemic. In his 21-minute inaugural speech, President Biden committed to being a leader of healing, appealing to Americans to end their uncivil war. The swearing-in of Vice President Kamala Harris also marked a new chapter in US politics. It breaks a cycle of more than two centuries of men in the most powerful seats in America. Correspondent Greg Jennett begins our coverage. Gallantly streaming still. The Capitol's ramparts, overrun only days ago... I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. ...stood preserved, protected and defended, the stage for a new presidency. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. Thank President. The invited applauded because no one else could. The virus forced people to be banished from a flag-filled mall. A joyous tear and a hug, then first shots in his promised fight for the soul of the nation. This is America's day. This is democracy's day. A day of history and hope, of renewal and resolve. Democracy is fragile. And at this hour, my friends, democracy has prevailed. In each of these moments, enough of us Enough of us have come together to carry all of us forward. And we can do that now. In the presence of presidents from both sides, he sought an armistice on ugly politics. We must end this uncivil war. We will get through this together. Wars end with reparations. There was no mention of the man who wasn't there, but Trump era techniques have been taken captive, never to be released. Recent weeks and months have taught us a painful lesson. There is truth and there are lies. I will always level with you. I, Kamala Davy Harris, I solemnly swear. Accompanied by the first and most powerful woman in presidential history, inspired by the polished words of a younger one. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. American aspiration is what drove the women of this nation throughout history to demand equal rights. The first and second couples were gifted mementos just captured and the flags that had fluttered aloft. Now, Joe Biden's march began via Arlington to honour fallen warriors. Then time for reflection was over. A home office awaited on Pennsylvania Avenue and the resident president was in a hurry to get there. 
part poetry, a little prayer, and all patriotism, but without the people to watch where they normally would here on the Mall. A new presidency seeks salvation for a troubled country. Joe Biden's defined his project in epic terms to write an American story that tells future generations this one rose to answer the call of history. It'd be quite some tale to tell, especially considering the state of the nation on day one. Greg Jennett, ABC News, Washington. With the stroke of a pen, Joe Biden has already begun dismantling the work of Donald Trump, overturning decisions on climate, Muslim arrivals and the pandemic. As for the former president, he might be out of office, but he's not out of trouble. His impeachment trial is set to begin within days. From Washington, Matthew Doran reports. One last shot from the outgoing president. The Trump snub of the Biden inauguration wasn't entirely surprising, given the former president still hasn't conceded defeat. I can tell you that from the bottom of my heart, this has been an incredible four years. But the fact he organised a farewell parade was viewed by many as one last attack on the decency expected from the occupants of the Oval Office and their entourage. We have worked hard. We've left it all, as the athletes would say, we've left it all in the field. That might be the 45th president's view, but his successor believes the Trump legacy is severely deficient. And I thought with the state of the nation today, there's no time to waste. Joe Biden signing 17 executive orders hours after moving into 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Among them, rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, mandating mask wearing to combat the COVID-19 crisis and halting further construction of Donald Trump's centrepiece policy, the border wall with Mexico. The new president also drawing a line in the sand on staff behaviour, which he argued had suffered under the previous administration. If you're ever working with me and I hear you treat another colleague with disrespect, talk down to someone, I promise you I will fire you on the spot. Some of the US's allies are looking forward to a partnership on a more even keel. The relationship is very strong and, uh, and as always with this relationship, its best days are still ahead of us. While there's work to do with those countries with more tricky ties, China wasted no time imposing sanctions against top officials in the Trump administration, including former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, for calling out human rights abuses. I think the new administration should serve the wishes of the people, view China in a rational and objective light. Even though Joe Biden wants to crack on with his own agenda, the shadow of Donald Trump will loom large over the new White House for a long time to come. The most pressing issue is the Senate impeachment trial over allegations he incited the deadly US Capitol riots earlier this month. That could start by the end of the week. We will be back in some form, so have a good life. We will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Watch this space. Matthew Doran, ABC News, Washington. So what impact will a Biden administration have on Australia? Political reporter Jane Norman joins us now from Parliament House. Jane, as we just heard, Joe Biden has moved quickly to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. Will that influence Australia's policies? Well, Juanita, President Biden has made it very clear that he is serious about tackling climate change and he believes other world leaders should do the same. So this is certainly an issue that Scott Morrison won't be able to avoid. Now, the next round of global climate talks are taking place later this year and that is when Australia will need to declare whether or not it's signing up to the target of net zero emissions by 2050. The PM has previously said it's achievable, but so far he has resisted the global momentum towards formally adopting that target. And that position, Juanita, will be much more difficult to maintain now that Joe Biden is in the White House. So can we expect much change in America's relationship with us and the wider region? 
Well, for all the chaos of the Trump years, the US-Australia alliance remains really strong. But Australia is certainly hoping that Biden will bring more predictability and really a return to regular diplomatic relations. When it comes to China, you can probably expect more continuity than change. Trump's approach of confronting Beijing was largely welcomed both in Washington and here in Australia. What wasn't welcomed was his America first approach and effective uh, withdrawal economically from the Indo-Pacific region um, by tearing up trade deals by um, or trade agreements, I should say, by uh, withdrawing from big global organisations. He created a vacuum that China effectively filled. So with Biden now in the White House, the expectation is that the US will rejoin some of those big global organisations and even try and find some areas of compromise with China. And Australia is expected to play a part there. Um, America is sending sort of early signals that it wants to work much more cooperatively, much more closely with allies in the region when it comes to countering China's rise. Jane Norman speaking to us there from Canberra. Still to come this hour, former FBI Director James Comey on the departure of the president who fired him. I think a trial in the United States Senate to hold Donald Trump accountable for his incitement of the attack on our democracy on the Capitol is an important thing. We need Donald Trump out of our lives, out of our heads, out of our spotlight, with a stamp on him that he crossed a line that no Americans could tolerate the crossing of. Plus, can Joe Biden fulfill his promise to unite America? That's coming up. Now to the rest of the day's news. People from Greater Sydney may be able to travel to South Australia from next weekend as New South Wales again records no new locally acquired cases of coronavirus. It's the fourth day in a row the state's had zero cases. Today's testing numbers were revised to 18,000 after a computer glitch was found. The South Australian Premier says it's too soon to make changes but he has indicated he plans to open the border to Greater Sydney in 10 days time all going well, uh, we would look to lift the restrictions with New South Wales midnight uh, on Saturday the 30th or one minute past midnight on the, on the 31st. From tomorrow, Tasmania will allow free travel for some but not all parts of Greater Sydney. It might sound hard to believe but almost 90% of Australian jobs lost to the pandemic have been recovered. The latest figures show 50,000 people started work in December, bringing the total to almost 800,000 new jobs in the past eight months. But experts warn that recovering the final 10% will be challenging. Mitch Crawford is one of the 900,000 people who lost their job in the first three months of the pandemic. It's pretty stressful, as you can imagine. Um, you just assume that you never have a job and you're never going to get back and you end up on the streets. But the 29-year-old secured a job in Melbourne late last year and is currently being trained by his new employer. There's a lot of relief, as you can imagine, um, to sort of get back into it. That relief is slowly becoming more widespread. All states but South Australia saw their unemployment rates fall in December, taking the national unemployment rate to 6.6%. The resilience of the Australian economy, but in particular, you know, the Australian employers and the businesses out there uh, should never be underestimated. The vast majority of job losses were recovered in about seven months, but restoring the final 10% won't be as easy. If you still have some businesses that can't operate at 100% at capacity, I think it will be difficult to get your staff levels back to 100% capacity as well. Recent jobs recovery has been significant, but it's not been like for like. In 2020, the number of full-time jobs fell. Part-time roles increased. And despite December's jobs growth, one and a half million people, like Karen Perkins, are on unemployment benefits. In two months, the government's job keeper and the increased job seeker payments will be wound back, which will see people like Karen struggle. I'm going to have to go back to buying food when they have specials, when they mark them down just a day or two before they go off. The unemployment rate remains 1.5% higher than what it was this time a year ago and economists predict it'll be years before it's back down near 5% again. The Reserve Bank warns that slow recovery means wages will be subdued for years to come. Rachel Papazzoni, ABC News. 
A teenage boy is tonight fighting for life after being pulled unconscious from a public swimming pool in Western Sydney. It's the latest emergency following a spate of drownings. Mark Reddy reports. What should be a place bustling with joy is nearly empty. Those who are at the Prairiewood Leisure Centre are in disbelief. Very, very shocking, especially when you hear the circumstances. A 17-year-old boy was found unconscious in the pool. Lifeguards performed CPR until paramedics arrived. I feel really sad. I feel sorry for his family, his friends, the people that work at the pool as well. The man was rushed to Liverpool Hospital. Police cars raced ahead of his ambulance to clear traffic. Families with young children were evacuated from the centre shortly after the incident. It remains closed as police investigate what went wrong. Just moments later, emergency services were called to Palm Beach. Two children had been swept into the sea. They made their own way back to shore, much to the relief of their families. Even since our Christmas Day, we've affected over a thousand rescues. Already this summer, before today, 13 people had drowned in New South Wales, eight in inland waterways like dams, lakes and rivers, one in a public pool and four on the coast. A heat wave over the next four days will draw even more people to the water. So vitally important based on the drowns we've had. Please come to a patrolled location this weekend. That's a location where you see the red and yellow flags flying. Authorities are warning people to prepare for the severe conditions. This might mean rescheduling some of our activities during the heat of the day, so staying indoors between about the hours of 11am and 5pm. Summer, a time for extra caution. Mark Reddy, ABC News, Sydney. The Premier's office has been cleared over any wrongdoing for shredding official documents. The opposition referred the Premier's office to the Information and Privacy Commission late last year. A parliamentary inquiry heard staffers shredded official papers related to a community grants program. Electronic rec records were also deleted but were eventually recovered. The Information Commissioner says an investigation has concluded without any further action, but she's warned ministerial officers to abide by their obligations. More refugees have today been released from a makeshift detention camp in a Melbourne hotel. Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton says it was cheaper than paying for their accommodation while their legal battle continues. A surprise bus ride to a long-awaited bridging visa. The 20 refugees released today have been given no explanation for the sudden decision to let them out. Kurdish refugee Mostafa Moz Azimataba has described this as the most beautiful moment of his life. I feel 34 years of uh, being under torture, trauma, sadness gone and now I am free like a bird. Activists and supporters have been fighting for their release from a makeshift detention centre in inner-city Melbourne. We cannot do this injustice anymore in this country. What are we about as Australians? Is this what we're about? The refugees were transported to Australia under the contentious Medivac law, which was in effect from March to December 2019. Many have spent more than 12 months locked in their hotel rooms for 23 hours a day. Today, the Home Affairs Minister offered an explanation. It's cheaper for people to be in the community than it is to be at a hotel or mm. uh, for us to be paying for them to be in, in detention. And if they're demonstrated not to be a threat or that's the assessment that's been made by the experts, while questions remain about the timing of the refugees being released, there are even more questions for the 14 men stuck in this hotel about why they've been left behind. It's leaving some feeling increasingly desperate. How long am I still here? Everyone go in the community. I'm still here at the detention centre. What I did? Why did the men still here? I'm without crime. There are also still 100 refugees in detention in Brisbane. Activists say they want the government to be more transparent about their future. Zala Karismal, ABC News, Melbourne. The Prime Minister Scott Morrison has criticised cricket authorities for dropping references to Australia Day in promotional material for next Tuesday's Big Bash. But Cricket Australia says it's comfortable with the move. 
Australia Day is out. Welcome to countries, barefoot circles and Indigenous kits this long weekend are in. Some of the injustices in society these days aren't right and the more we can educate and, and learn about it, the better. But the Prime Minister has taken exception to Cricket Australia's plan to abandon the term Australia Day in Big Bash promotions this weekend. Look, I think Australian cricket fans would like to see Cricket Australia focus a lot more on cricket and a lot less on politics. People say don't bring sport into politics, but seriously, sport has been involved in politics since year dot, hasn't it, on, on a variety of different fronts. So, um, look, it is. I think sport is a wonderful vehicle for social change. Scott Morrison described the push as pretty ordinary and urged CA to listen to any backlash from fans opposed to the decision and reverse it. But CA is holding its ground. Cricket Australia is very, very comfortable with where we're at. The Perth Scorchers are one of the teams this weekend who will wear an Indigenous kit and stage a welcome to country. It's come from a cricket decision space. Um, we be more than happy to have a chat with the Prime Minister about this more just so that um, he can sort of see where we're coming from. It's not the first time Mr Morrison has attempted to intervene in moves made by Sporting Codes. Last year, he successfully lobbied the National Rugby League to backflip on a decision not to play the National Anthem during the State of Origin series. Tom Wildey. ABC News. Taxpayers are facing a compensation bill of tens of millions of dollars over plans to dump a troubled submarine contract with a US military company. In 2018, Defence signed a $300 million deal with Phoenix International to provide new escape and rescue equipment for Australia's Collins class submarines. But a recent review has recommended it now be scrapped. The Navy will instead stick with its ageing British designed rescue system for the rest of this decade. Discussions on a settlement will begin soon between the Commonwealth and the American supplier. Some residents in Western Sydney are furious about a major apartment development which will be almost twice as high as the original proposal. The buildings in Wentworth Point were initially meant to be nine storeys high. Angry locals fear that a much bigger development will impact on their quality of life. For the past 13 years, Paul Nowak and his wife Sharon Rowlands have seen their Wentworth Point neighbourhood transformed with low-rise apartments. But they say plans for a new high-rise development is a step too far. It creates an eyesore. So as you come in, you have this huge building that's out of sync uh, with the rest of the apartments around here. Two nine-storey blocks were initially approved for Benelong Parkway. Then in 2018, developer Piety wanted the heights increased to 35 and 25 storeys. Community outcry saw that scaled back to 15 storeys, which the state's planning department approved last month. But residents are furious. They signed up to nine. Uh, there's no excuse for them to go one storey more. Headlining community concerns an increase in congestion. We've got Hill Road, which is the only road coming into Wentworth Point, is just crazy in the mornings and afternoons. Community advocate Clement Loon fears the huge development will put more pressure on public transport, especially after a planned light rail stop was all but scrapped last year. At the moment, there's about 13,000 residents living in this area, in this peninsula. Um, they're projecting about 25,000. And there's been no provisions for you know, additional roads or additional transport. As a parent, he's also worried about the strain on the local school. The primary school here was built at uh, only 400 capacity. Uh, the school opened two years ago and uh, it's already got demandables. Despite almost 1,500 submissions formally objecting, including from Parramatta Council, the proposal was given the green light. The planning department deemed the height increase to be consistent with the evolving character of Wentworth Point and it was satisfied it wouldn't result in any unreasonable traffic impacts. It's a farce. What's the point of asking people to respond if you're then not going to take their responses into, into consideration? The developer now will have to lodge a DA with Parramatta City Council before a planning panel would decide whether construction here can go ahead. A decision these residents will be closely following. Lydia Feng, ABC News, Sydney. On to finance now, and the local share market jumped up after Wall Street had one of its biggest inauguration day rises in history. Here's Alan Kohler. The S&P 500 jumped 1.4% and Nasdaq 2%, with tech stocks leading the way, as usual. Especially Netflix, which reported that it now has 200 million subscribers, 37 million more than a year ago, thanks to the pandemic. 
That 1.4% rise by the S&P 500 was the biggest inauguration day gain since Ronald Reagan was sworn in for a second term in March 1985. And the only bigger one than that was Franklin D. Roosevelt's first inauguration in 1933 during the Great Depression. The positive mood rubbed off on the Australian market with big gains by the Buy Now Pay Later Brigade, Zipco and Afterpay. But also retail and mosaic brands jumped 31% after reporting a huge increase in sales, although that was all about technology as well. Its online sales soared 31% and are now 17% of turnover. Apart from that, the banks and miners also did OK. The dollar jumped after those strong employment figures and is now sitting just below 78 US cents. And just on the employment data, most of the jobs growth is part-time. Full-time jobs are still 1.3% below March levels, but part-time work is now higher than that. But the good news is that the big rise in job vacancies recently should mean that the labour market momentum will stay strong. And that should mean that the JobKeeper cliff, which is when the support is removed, should be manageable. Finally, on commodity markets, gold and copper went up, oil and iron ore went down. And that's finance. Tennis world number one Novak Djokovic says his controversial hotel quarantine demands have been misconstrued and he's expressed gratitude to Victorians and Tennis Australia. Players took to the court in Melbourne today during one of the most unique Australian Open build-ups in history. It's been a long four days and quarantine tennis players are a long way from conquering their first Australian challenge. While some have embraced the unique circumstances, other tennis players' complaints have raised the ire of some. So I spent seven months in isolation, so two weeks, suck it up. They should feel lucky that they get the opportunity to travel during the pandemic. I think they just sucks. They need to grow up. Novak Djokovic received a volley of criticism when he sent a list of demands to open organisers, proposing a change to quarantine conditions. Last night, the eight-time Melbourne Park champion took to social media, saying his comments had been misconstrued and that he wanted to use his earned privileges to stick up for lesser players. Your main concern is, is, is to be ready to, to perform and to be ready to compete. Uh, so obviously by spending 14 days in the room, uh, that gets taken away. Players not in full lockdown were back out on the court today. China's Shui Zhang and Japan's Masaki Doi have become hitting partners after both their coaches were sent into isolation. Australia's Alex Dimonor was just happy to be back in familiar surrounds. Meanwhile, the Victorian Premier apologised to residents living near a tennis quarantine hotel who say they found used PPE on their doorstep. I understand that there was a delay in a scheduled uh, PPE pickup, so the, the the garbage truck basically had turned up late. But quarantine officials contradicted that today and said they'd review exactly what happened. There'll be more back and forth before the Open gets underway in February. Elias Clure, ABC News, Melbourne. Time for the weather now and New South Wales is heading into heatwave territory. Sydney had a taste of what's to come. A dry, warm, sunny day with a top of 28. But from tomorrow, maximums will jump up into the 30s. A mild to warm day in the east but hot in the west. Overnight lows were slightly cooler than average. There were some isolated showers and thunderstorms this afternoon about the central and northern regions but the state was mostly dry and sunny. It was especially hot west of the divide, nudging 40 degrees in the northwest. With heat building in the country's interior, it was a hot day for Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Canberra, all in the 30s. A dry, hot air mass is being pulled across southern and central New South Wales, leading to severe heatwave conditions for inland parts of the state on the weekend. West of the ranges, some areas will hit 45 degrees. Even western Sydney will get up to 40. A sea breeze will keep coastal areas more bearable. Cooling down in Melbourne tomorrow, but the real worry there will be on Monday when the forecast is for 40 degrees and strong winds. Around New South Wales tomorrow, the northeast will largely miss out on the heatwave conditions. Tomorrow will be warm along the coast, high 20s, but getting up to 31 further inland at Grafton. Northeasterly winds freshening along the coast. It'll be hot, dry, and sunny across the south and the west of the state. Daytime temps well above average, particularly across the south.
A strong wind warning has been issued for the Batemans and Eden coastal areas. Inland showers and storms and very hot in the northwest, reaching 41. Winds on Sydney waters northerly to 25 knots. In Sydney tomorrow, mostly sunny with showers and an afternoon thunderstorm a possibility. The sun will rise at 6.05 and the dry heat will continue for the next five days. Maximum temperatures in the city will be in the 30s and they'll peak on Tuesday with 34 degrees before showers and a cooling of daytime temperatures. Laura Tingle is here now with 7.30.